I can tell you what I wish everyone knew. So in psychology, we think of happiness in two ways. There's hedonic happiness and eudaimonic. And hedonic happiness is basically sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Like it's all the things that give you a material pleasure. It could be money, power, fame, you know, food. And it's kind of self-centered, right? It's about like me and my little dopamine hit, you know, that's really what it is. And that dopamine hit doesn't last, right? You, you, you eat a piece of chocolate or you get a fat check and then you're happy for a moment and then you come crashing back down and you want more. Mm -hmm. And I think that most, you know, marketing agents out there in the world that are trying to sell us stuff are really trying to sell us this, this idea of hedonic happiness. And yet it's, it's a never ending treadmill because you'll never actually reach the fulfillment you're looking for. You'll get little pieces of joy here and there, little pieces of pleasure, right? So then there's eudaimonic happiness. And eudaimonic happiness is the happiness you get from something beyond yourself, from helping others, from connecting with um, people ar around you in a positive way, uh, being of service, from connecting with nature, connecting with a greater purpose. Like maybe you're working towards alleviating animal suffering on the planet or whatever it is, right? That form of happiness is a form of happiness that doesn't just give you a dopamine hit and then a drop. It actually lasts. And it's what I would say leads to more than happiness, but to fulfillment. And when mm -hmm. you look at it from a scientific perspective, people who engage in more eudaimonic activities, they actually have less inflammation at the cellular level. They live longer lives. They're healthier, not just happier. And I think that's one of the best kept secrets because there's no marketing agents out there telling you, hey, go out and do some community service. Nope. Nobody's going to make money off of you connecting, you know, hugging a tree, right? But there's a lot of money to be made on get, trying to get people little highs and that's fine. But I just wish pe more people knew that if you really want to be happy, then what you need is actually free. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. It's so simple, but it's, I think it's something people hear, but they don't understand the depths of it. Like the point where you say people are actually healthier and live longer when they, you know, do those, like ha have that deeper level of happiness, not just the hedonistic dopamine, sh like cheap happiness. Yeah, absolutely. And actually people who um, prioritize hedonic happiness in their life have inflammation levels as high as people going through very stressful life experiences like war. If you think about it, it wow. it's really crazy. Why, why is that? Why, why do you think so? Perhaps it because those lifestyles are not as healthy generally, if you're partying a lot or... And the other thing is you're on this treadmill, right? Even if let's say you're someone who's just gets off on getting a lot of social media likes, right? And then you're, it's a treadmill and it, it's a constant chase. It's actually a stressor. Mm. It's actually stress. Whereas when you're doing something for others, like, like let's say you're, you're, you know, you're, you're putting out content to help other people with their, their mental health, their well-being, then you're not thinking about yourself. You're not in this mad chase uh, for, you know, for survival for yourself, you're in it for others. Your nervous system relaxes. And I think we have all been there where maybe we weren't having a great day, but all of a sudden a friend calls us and is like, hey, I'm having an emergency and you go to the emergency room or something like that. And you just go all out and you go help them and you're there for them. You feel great. You feel amazing. You feel uplifted. You know, this, the, the quote unquote helpers high, which I think is a, too simplistic of a word for it because it's more than that. It's, it's, when it becomes a way of living, it really expands your, not just your mental health, but your, again, your sense of fulfillment, of joy, of purpose and meaning. Yeah, definitely. Um, aside from that big point, was there anything else surprising that you learned in your years of research? Yes. So I'll start with a personal story. I, um, after returning from China and just as I was doing my master's in East Asian studies, I was in Manhattan in New York city. I was, um, attending Columbia at the time and 9-11 happened and I saw the second plane crash. And after that day, every morning before leaving my apartment, my whole body would shake with anxiety. And I tried so many things. I, I didn't want to go the medicine route, but I, you know, I was going to Bikram yoga, you know, hot yoga, like four or five times a week. And, you know, my skin was glowing, but I was still anxious. I was, I tried mindfulness meditation, but when you have really high anxiety, sitting down to try and meditate can be really hard. It's not a great first step because you just become super aware that you're anxious. Yeah. And it wasn't until I walked into a breathing class um, called Sky Breath Meditation offered by this nonprofit called Art of Living that I was able to regain my ability to, to sleep, to function, to, to my inner sovereignty. I was able to regain it through, through breathing. And that was really a personally very, very transformative for me. And then I went on to grad school and 10 years later, 
I'm working with veterans with trauma, veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan with trauma. And many of them were cases where traditional treatments hadn't worked for them, therapy, pharmaceuticals hadn't worked. And a lot of them were self-medicating with alcohol and, and recreational drugs just to try and make it through. And I thought, well, you know, breathing can work for me. Maybe it'll work for them. And so we ran a study that was actually documented in a documentary called uh, free the mind in which we had the veterans go through this breathing protocol mm -hmm. it's called sky breath meditation. And then a, a group of them did not, that was the control group. And what we found was that after one week, their anxiety normalized and it was still normal a, a month and a year later as compared to the control group. And so that was really, you know, from a scientific perspective, you don't expect something to have those long lasting effects. And that was really also the most meaningful study I've ever run. We did do a follow up wow. to it, comparing it to the gold standard therapy and Again, the breathing was either equivalent to or superior to that. What's gold standard therapy again? The gold standard therapy for post-traumatic stress is called cognitive processing therapy. So I would say, you know, that's surprising. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of research on breathing for serious mental health issues. You know, now there are more and more people who are talking about breathing, you know, becoming master breathwork instructors or whatever. Yeah. And I would say there's many different breathing techniques. So I can't vouch for all of the ones that are out there, but definitely for the sky breath meditation technique is really powerful. Yeah, no, I can totally vouch for, like I've tried a few different breath work experiences and courses, and it's amazing how much you can do with your body, how much you can heal just by your breath. And it's completely free. And I, yes. like, I'm glad more people are learning about this, but I, I still think it is a very new area. And I recently saw, um, you know, James Nestor, he wrote the book Breath. Mm -hmm. So I, I saw yes. him speak recently, which is why this is fresh on my mind, right? Like our, our breathing is just such a big part of our health and healing. But I, I'm curious if you can give us some, like, like what is sky breathing and why do you think it worked? It's a protocol that takes a couple of days to learn. So you should learn it from a trained instructor, um, again, through a nonprofit called Art of Living. But if you're a veteran or military, there's a nonprofit called Project Welcome Home Troops that teaches it at no charge, which is really nice. Um, but what I would say is um, what I can do is like teach a short breathing practice now if you want that, you know, you could do it in a few minutes. Okay, sure. Why not? So um, when you inhale, your heart rate increases. And when you exhale, it slows down. So... If we do an exercise right now for like two minutes, I can show you how to tap into your parasympathetic nervous system and calm your nervous system down in just a few, just a few minutes. Do you want to do that? Sure. Okay. So if we were to close our eyes we can and have our hands, palms facing up and just notice how you feel right now. And then you'll notice again how you feel after, after the two minutes. And then breathing through the nose, breathe in for a count of one, two, three, four, hold. And breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Breathe in, two, three, four, hold. And breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Breathe in, two, three, four, hold. And breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Breathe in, long deep breath in, hold at the top and breathe out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A couple more times, deep breath in. Two, three, four, hold and breathe out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And breathe in. Two, three, four, hold and breathe out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then just notice, come back to normal breath and notice how you feel. And then when you notice any changes and when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Mm. What do you notice? Mm, I just notice like breathing deeper just calms my body more. Like my belly expands a lot more. I think once you tell me to breathe, then I'm like, oh, I notice my breathing. Cause normally you don't notice your breathing. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Like it, this slow breathing, like activates the, the calm, the calming effect on your body. That's right. And 
we actually ran a study at Yale with undergraduates here. And, um, you know, over the course of a semester, they usually, their mental health declines, their burnout increases. And we wanted to see, can we somehow prevent that? And so we randomly assigned students to either the sky breath meditation class where they learned the whole longer sky breathing protocol right. or a mindfulness-based stress reduction group learning mindfulness meditation or an emotional intelligence group that learned just cognitive skills of like reframing and a control group. And we wanted to see which group would do best. And by the end of the semester, the one that had the best results by far was the breathing group. And we think it's because we're not just addressing the mind, you know, change your mind, change your life kind of thing. We're also... I'm not just becoming aware of the mind, like mindfulness, but we're also going right in the physiology mm -hmm. and conditioning the nervous system for greater calm. So, yeah. you know, exercises yeah. like the one we just did, I think are really good for in the moment, like you're transitioning from work to home or before a big meeting or after a stressful moment. But then the sky breath meditation is ideal for kind of conditioning your nervous system, like you condition your muscles in the gym so that you're stronger in life, conditioning your nervous system so you have more stress resilience. And that's what right. my colleague at Harvard found that after doing the sky breath meditation, when they placed participants into a stressful situation, they responded with less of a stress, re stress response. It's something you do when you're feeling stressed, or is it just something that you continue doing every day to ma be able to manage that stress? It's something you do to condition your nervous system so you have less of a stress response in the first place. Mm. So you're calmer, see? Right, right. Yeah, that's how I think of it. Just like you go to the gym to condition your muscles so you're stronger. Yeah. No, I love it. And I also agree with how I think a lot of times Western psychology or mental health is just about the mind and they forget about bringing it down to the body because so much of right? everything, like the mind body is the same, right? But we're just focusing on up here by talking. Yes. And that's been so frustrating to me. And I think it's because academics, and I'm surrounded by academics because I've only been at universities, are so like disembodied. They're in their head. And so I, that's one of my theories as to why psychology is so in the head. But even working with like veterans or with children, you see they're not in their head. And they're kind of like, uh, can we please do something like, you know, more embodied? And, you know, the veterans in particular, they have this show me attitude. They're like, okay, what's this hippie dippy stuff? Like they came to our study just being like, we're just here to get paid. And I was like, that's <laughs> great. Like, I love that attitude, you yeah. know, just have a show me attitude. Yeah. And the moment they started breathing, they're like, okay, we get it. Because mm. they can immediately see the results as opposed to some of these other techniques just in the head. Yeah. If you've got anxiety in your body, it's like there was one veteran, he, he was like, I'm standing in front of the mall in Wisconsin. I know there's no danger in the mall, but I have to brace myself for 20 minutes before I can walk in. There's nothing wrong with his mind, but the trauma is locked in his body. And so being able to do the breathing could unlock that, and release that. So then he can go on, go into the mall without having to brace himself for 20 minutes. Yeah. I think that's something that hopefully more people in the academic world <laughs> can understand. Cause I, I've like studied like holistic Eastern healing and a lot of it is like body work. And so I think there's, you know, there, there's so many compartments to healing and I think yes. we're just starting to understand putting it together. Yes. I'm so glad that you're, You've been studying that because that's what's been missing is the embodied component of healing. And when we can address that and, and make ourselves more whole as opposed to, right. right? We already live in a very disembodied age. We're all like on our media, like in a virtual world, far from nature, right? It's true where we're living in this like heady, like virtual r world of social media, everything. But then we forget that earth is right here. It's all around yeah. us. <laughs> Our body is here and nature is here. And yeah, we have to connect sometimes, <laughs> you know? It's so, so true. Yeah. And that's why nature is another, nature is another secret to happiness. You know, research shows that spending time in nature improves anxiety, depression. Um, it, it improves so your, your ability to think clearly, your attention, your memory, your creativity. It even improves your communication skills. It's amazing. And yeah. it's free if you have access. Of course, a lot of people don't have access, but even having a plant on your desk, like I have plants you can see here you know, it has an impact. And if you don't have even a window to have plants, you can have a screensaver or a poster. And that even that makes a, a difference, researchers. That's how connected we are to nature.